Hey everybody and welcome back to another video. Now today we're going to be talking about why some people get tinnitus, why others do not get tinnitus. So let's get started. Let's quickly remember what action potentials are. Uh, now for a full and more detailed description on action potentials, I recommend watching my Lanier vs. Susan Shore device video, the 30 minute one, but I'm going to give a small description here just so that you remember what it is. Now real quick, what is an action potential? An action potential is a rapid change in membrane potential. You can imagine this as the neuron being more positive or more negative. More positively charged neurons actually have a higher chance to transmit their signal to the next one. Keep this in mind. While the more negatively charged one actually has less chance. Depolarization is the process when the uh, membrane potential becomes more positive. Repolarization is when it becomes more negative. And hyperpolarization is this kind of little uh, dip right here, when the neuron slowly recovers its resting state and prepares itself to fire the next action potential. Now there's a certain period, which is like maybe around right here or right here, it's called the refractory period. And this is when the action potential cannot be fired again. Now keep all of this in mind when we move on throughout this video. Now, when there are too many action potentials, uh, like for example, with loud noise or consistent loud noise exposure, uh, calcium ions, which are the positively charged ions that have a role to play in the depolarization, uh, there is actually way too many of them on the inside of the nerve cell. And generally, this is kind of important for nerve signaling overall, because like I mentioned before, it's important for the nerve to have a positive charge to be able to transmit this electric signal to the next one. But if there's too much of it, this basically means that the nerve cell is too positively charged, and that means the threshold to fire another action potential can be reached easier. Now keep in mind, what we're actually going to be talking about today is how this heightened activity can potentially lead to long-term potentiation. We're not actually going to be talking about long-term potentiation or the strengthening of synaptic connections because I described that well enough in my Lanier versus Susan Shore video. We're going to be talking about the delicate mechanisms that can actually lead to these action potentials being fired more frequently which will eventually lead to long-term potentiation. But again, to watch more about long-term potentiation, please watch my Susan Shore versus Lanier video. Now, this is called excitotoxicity. When there is too much calcium influx, which can also not only on the postsynaptic neuron affect the uh, depolarization process, but it can also actually affect the amount of excitatory neurotransmitters, ergoglutamate, that are released into the synaptic cleft or the space between the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron that then bind to the receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. Now, there is a lot of this excitatory neurotransmitter, ergoglutamate, and this kind of sends the nerve cells into overdrive. They start working really, really hard. Now, as we all know, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. You can see the mitochondria right here. And when the mitochondria becomes overworked due to excited toxicity or, you know, too much calcium influx or too much glutamate, its function actually begins degrading. And when the mitochondria's function starts degrading, it can actually affect very important parts of the nerve cell. For example, the sodium-potassium pump. Now, what is the sodium-potassium pump? As you can see on the diagram, the sodium-potassium pump regulates the resting state of the nerve cell. It balances the positively charged ions to make sure that the nerve cell is consistently in the resting state. Now, if this sodium-potassium pump actually stops working as well because of an over overworked mitochondria, 
this can actually potentially lead to the resting membrane potential of the nerve cell to be too positive. And as we all know, too much positivity means the threshold will be reached easier and faster right here, which means the action potential will be fired much more. If anybody is confused as to what ATP is, as you can see, it's basically how the mitochondria send energy to various parts of the nerve cell. Like I mentioned previously, an overworked mitochondria will less efficiently produce ATP and also release reactive oxygen species that further harm the cell, but that's another, that's another topic eventually leading to a destabilized or more positive resting state. So for example, too much loud noise can cause this, as I said in the beginning. And basically any overstimulation, pretty much. Now let's move on to Thanos' model up here. Now this is very important because this explains why some people have tinnitus from a concert, for example, and others do not. To give a brief explanation of what some of this is, an HCN is a type of ion channel. And as we know, ion channels are very important for regulating the positive or negative charge inside the nerve cell. Now, what does the HCN channel do specifically? After an action potential is fired, as you can see in the diagram, and when the uh, membrane potential becomes more negative, as we can see here, what the HCN is responsible for is this slow increase, actually, back to the resting state. So what it actually does is that it allows positive ions, specifically sodium ions, to rush back into the cell, but not as fast, to recover the... Um, resting state. Now about KCNQ23 that you can see here, this refers to potassium ion channels, more specifically voltage-gated potassium ion channels. Now what these actually do, or ion channels in general, is that they regulate the nerve signal down to the next neuron actually. So because the signal can actually be lost while it's traveling through the nerve cell, these ion channels make sure that the nerve signal is just as strong as it was uh, when it goes on to the next one. Specifically, the potassium ion channels, they allow for the positively charged potassium ions to flow out of the cell if the um, nerve signal is too strong. In other words, they allow the signal to become dampened. Now, why is this so important? Because when the KCNQ2-3 channels are actually dysfunctional or they have reduced activity, what that means is that the massive, very intense action potential from the presynaptic neuron is not going to become dampened as well when it travels on to the postsynaptic neuron. So what does that mean? That means that a reduced KCNQ2-3 activity actually supports hyperactivity or increased activity. You're probably wondering why in the world does there reduced KCNQ2-3 activity? Now the intracellular mechanisms and processes that actually happen here are very complex, but basically to put it simply, excitotoxicity or, you know, the rapid calcium influx actually glitches out the nerve cell. And that includes the ion channels as well, not only the KCNQ23, but also the HCN. Now, why this happens for some and why this doesn't happen for others? Well, that's a difficult question. Um, to put it very simply, basically genetics. Some people are more resilient to this nerve cell glitching out and others have it quote unquote, glitch out easier back to the Thanos model. What is actually going on here? When there's a certain amount of time post noise exposure, and this is actually why some people have their tinnitus appear days and days, sometimes weeks after, there happens a split into two separate uh, groups. That's the non-tinnitus group and the tinnitus group. 
what happens in the tinnitus group is that the reduced KCNQ2-3 voltage-gated ion channel, specifically potassium ion channel, still has a reduced state, which means the regulation or the dampening of the nerve signal is still broken. Now, coupled with this actually is the normal HCN activity. Now, why is this so important? If we have reduced KCNQ2-3 activity, that means that there's more positive charge in the um, nerve cell, which potentially means the threshold for an action potential will be reached easier. And if the HCN or HCN ion channels function correctly, that means that during the hyperpolarization, more positively charged ions, specifically sodium, will rush into the cell. Now, what does that give us? That means that our positive charge in the cell is not regulated correctly by the uh, voltage-gated potassium ion channels, which means there's more positivity because the uh, potassium ions don't flow out correctly. And because the HCN works correctly as well, that means that the nerve cell will actually send more positively charged ions than is necessary. So we have too many potassium ions in the nerve cell and we also have sodium ions that are also rushing in to try and hyperpolarize the neuron. That means that the resting state will be achieved faster, and that means that the next action potential will also be fired faster. What happens to most people is that their, um, the function of their KCNQ2-3 ion channels actually recovers. This is also called homeostatic plasticity or neural homeostasis. Uh, these are the mechanisms by which the neurons maintain stable functioning. For some people, this is happening adequately, or the uh, homeostatic plasticity is happening normally. This is, again, this is the recovery of these uh, ion channels to normal function. Combined together with reduced HCN activity, this means that the positively charged ions are actually flowing out correctly, which means the nerve cell has less charge, and the positively charged um, sodium ions are actually flowing in slower during the hyperpolarization process because of the reduced HCN. And this means that the hyperpolarization is very slow and smooth, which actually means that there is less action potentials being fired. As we all know, many action potentials being fired leads to a lot of calcium influx. And as I mentioned in my previous videos, uh, a repeated and very rapid firing of the action potentials leads to a very, very rapid influx of calcium which then in turn actually signals the neuron that this um, synaptic connection is important and more amperoceptors are added to the cell membrane. And more amperoceptors means more glutamate binding to these receptors, which then means that the threshold is reached easier, which means that even more calcium influx is happening because more action potentials are being fired. You guys see the pattern here? This whole process is very, very delicate, and it's actually, you know, thankfully it's not so easy to throw into disbalance, but such things like neuroinflammation, which actually can affect uh, neurotransmitter activity, taking certain meds like antidepressants, and the dorsal cochlear nucleus, by the way, has a lot of these um, serotonin receptors, by the way. Nobody really knows why, but it does. And these mechanical cofactors or irritants of the somatosensory pathway, which we all know is very, very strongly connected to the dorsocochlear nucleus. All of these things that are thrown into disbalance can lead to this disastrous process that I have described to you today. Ladies and gentlemen, what does that mean? Well, that means that um, a large group of people, the tinnitus sufferers, we were unlucky enough to actually have this long-term potentiation caused by this cascade of action potentials that is happening like throughout our auditory pathway due to numerous cofactors. Thankfully, most people actually have a little bit of tinnitus, 
and this cascade of action potentials is not so easily reached, but the more you abuse your body and the less careful you are, and the more you ignore your somatosensory um, cofactors like uh, your neck, your jaw health, all of this, and also abusing um, antidepressants or benzodiazepines, all of this together can actually lead to the tinnitus becoming extremely severe. So, everybody, be careful. That's about it for today. See ya.